Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Center for the Humanities Brown Bag Monthly Lunchtime Series. We're delighted to welcome Jessica Frazier to give today's talk. And first, I would like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Alan Burskin, Professor of Jewish and Islamic History, to introduce Jessica. Jessica Frazier is an associate professor at the University of Island, Rhode Island in the history of, uh, in, sorry, I can't talk today, in the history and gender and women's studies departments. Her current book project, Creating Transnational Feminist Networks, 1940 to 2000, traces the genealogy of transnational feminist praxis in the late 20th and early 21st centuries through collective biography. Her first book, Women's Anti-War Diplomacy During the Vietnam War Era, came up with the University of North Carolina Press, was chosen as the 2017 Outstanding Academic Title by Choice Magazine, and her research interests revolve around trans transnational feminism, social movements, intersectionality, and human rights. And her current book, book project is on this figure, Noah El Sadawi. And uh, it's an unbelievably important topic. I've read Sadawi's works, and they cry out for more modern engagement. So this is truly wonderful that uh, Professor Frazier is engaging in this. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jessica. Thank you, Dr. Burskin, and thank you to Professor Stern for inviting me to be here today. And thank you to Laura for taking care of all the technology aspects of today's talk. I'm gonna begin with a quote. <clears throat> Few people have been so consistently in demand at meetings and discussions at the NGO forum as Nawal El Sadawi, the Egyptian doctor, writer, activist, and feminist, declared press coverage of the United Nations Second World Conference on Women in Copenhagen in 1980. Nawal El Sadawi, an advocate for women's rights in the Arab world and outspoken critic of President Anwar Sadat's regime in Egypt, quickly gained international attention during the three week long meetings. Now, there were two parts to the Second World Conference on Women there was the NGO forum, the non governmental organization forum, at which activists and other interested parties could attend. And then there was the quote unquote official um, conference at which UN delegates and government diplomats attended. Um, and this was the second conference in a series of three UN, UN conferences on women that took place during the UN decade for women from 1975 to 1985. And the purpose of the Copenhagen conference was to draw attention to the issues of health, education and employment in terms of women's status. And some government delegations successfully pushed to include the issues of apartheid, Palestinians, and refugees onto the agenda as well. Now, because El Sadawi was an advisor at the UN's Economic Commission for West Africa and Beirut and had studied Arab women's rights issues for years, the conference secretariat and planning committee invited her to speak at a two day pre conference journalist encounter, as well as at three panels during the NGO forum. So clearly El Sadari was already well known enough to garner such invitations, but her forthrightness and outspokenness at the Copenhagen Con Conference launched her into the international realm and allowed her to create transnational bonds of feminist solidarity on her own terms. So this paper built off of scholarship on Noel El Sadari's life and work. And the, the uh, book that I have pictured there is one of the first uh, full books on her, on her writing. So both literary and Arab world scholars have written much on El Sadawi, focusing on her writing and analyzing the ways in which she combined her many roles as a doctor, a psychologist, an author, and an advocate to bring attention to the injustices that she saw in the world, in Arab society, and in Egypt through her publications. Now, other scholars have focused on the ways in which Nawa El Sadawi's work has been misread by feminists, journalists, and politicians in the global north, especially in the United States. A prolific writer of both fiction and nonfiction, 
Elsa Dai was known for her ability to cut through the noise to reveal the core of issues, especially in terms of women's rights violations. Now my contribution, so this paper contributes to these bodies of scholarship in several ways. First, using a historical lens, it shows change over time in terms of Elsa Dowie's activism and her perspectives. Second, it places Elsa Dowie's life and work within the historical context of Egypt. And third, it situates Elsa Dowie within the evolution of transnational feminist networks in the late 20th century. And this is the most unique contribution that it's making. Thus, it explains why Elsa Dowie turned to the international realm how she was received and how her international activism affected her circumstances in her home country. In doing so, this paper reveals a complex story of feminist interaction that included criticism, challenges, condemnation, and commendation, as it shows that Elsa Dowie challenged feminist stereotypes in several ways. Namely, she challenged stereotypes about feminists and feminisms, as well as stereotypes held by feminists living in the global world. In the years leading up to the Copenhagen Conference, Elsa Dowie had increasingly come into contact with outside perspectives on the Arab world. For instance, in June 1976, Elsa Dowie attended an international conference on women and development at Wellesley College in the United States, which promised, quote, to bring together people interested in issues that women must confront in Latin America, Africa, Asia, and the Middle East as their countries undergo profound social, economic, and cultural changes. In a group of scholars at Wellesley College at the research center there on women coordinating the conference worked with a program committee of academics that held primarily from top-notch universities on the east coast of the United States. And they, their aim was to bring together women from all over the world. The conference received sponsorship from the from USAID, the Rockefeller Foundation, and the Ford Foundation, among others. And the program committee, however, neglected a few key aspects of conference design, and in so doing, maintained an imbalance of power, which hindered collaboration across geopolitical and cultural differences. And Elsa Dowie quickly discerned some of the problematic assumptions that underlay the execution of the conference, because she wanted to have an exchange of ideas about women's roles in society in a productive manner at future international conferences, she decided to team up with Moroccan feminist Fatima Mounisi, who had recently graduated with a PhD in sociology from Brandeis University, and uh, Thai social scientist Malika Badrathan, who had worked in various branches of the UN since the 1960s, to write an analysis of the conference. So Elsa Dawi Mounisi and Badrathan published a critique of the conference and recently created International Feminist Bulletin in April 1977, and then that critique was then picked up by other feminist uh, periodicals and here at in this feminist quarter quest and what circled on the screen is um, is that the uh, their critique in the table of contents. And six months after their original critique was published, a special issue of Science, Science is an academic journal based on the interdisciplinary field of women's studies uh, dedicated to the conference proceedings. In that special issue of Science, three conference participants wrote reflections that similarly brought attention to and posed questions about the organization and purpose of the Wellesley Conference. And many of the points brought up in those reflections dovetailed with issues that Elsa Dowie, Mernice, and Bedra Thon had brought up in their critique. Now, the first issue was in terms of the poor organization in, in terms of allowing for equal or proportionate participation of women from the global south. And at the heart of the manner, matter in the words of Professor Au, Professor of History at the University of Ibadan in, in Nigeria, was that, quote, participation of third world scholars at the three main levels of organizing, panel convening, and presenting papers was totally inadequate. The conference therefore became, she continued, in the main, one organized largely by women from the developed countries, especially from the United States, for third world women, end quote. And in their piece, Elsa Dawi, Mernice, and Bajrathan supported this point by providing a table that compared the number of organizers and presenters who hailed from institutions in the global north, all of the organizers did, and two thirds of the presenters did, compared to the, the global south. And with 500 attendees at this conference, but only 80 presenters, this meant that Nawal Elsa Dawi, who did not present a paper, was likely not the only one who, quote, found herself sitting in the audience listening to an American woman speak about Egypt, her home country, end quote. 
And to Elsa Dowie's dismay, she learned that the woman, quote, had spent three months in Egypt. She wrote a book, and there she was preaching and teaching about Egypt, end quote. In addition, Elsa Dowie, Munisi, and Badger Khan noted that on a number of occasions, women from the Global South were kept from engaging in conversations with presenters because speakers would go over time and they'd use up all the question and answer period or because they're not allowed to interrupt papers. And by the end of the conference, it seemed to Elsa Dowie, Munisi, and Badger Khan that the conference conveners viewed academics from the Global North as the primary experts on the status of women in the Global South, and even seemed to believe that women from the Global South had no valuable insights to add. Now, the second point that they made in their critique was about the poor analysis on the part of some scholars from the Global North who ignored colonial legacies, international relations, and economic disparities within their own societies. So for Professor Au, the quote, insufficient appreciation of the historical experiences to which women in some of these societies have been subjected, in quote, meant that scholars ignored the consequences of colonial policies that had fundamentally altered the structures of communities and families. Some of these legacies continued in the guise of development itself, according to anthropologist Eleanor Leacock at the City University of New York. In her reflection on the conference, Leacock argued that development policies and practices too often maintained, quote, systems whereby rich nations continue to underdevelop poor nations by consuming a huge proportion of the world's resources, while multinational corporations grossly underpay third world workers, end quote. Elsa Dowie knew about such practices through her lived experiences in Egypt, but had come to understand the issue in terms of women in development when she visited a tea plantation in India in the early 1970s. There, she interviewed women who picked tea leaves and discovered that those who produced the tea had no opportunity to drink it, as it was either all exported or sold at such high prices that only the elite in India could buy it. For Elsa Dowie, this kind of injustice should have been central to the conversations at Wellesley, but she found instead that, quote, Western women put the emphasis on the conditions of oppression of women in developing countries, the causes of those, this oppression become secondary, end quote. And so the causes in Elsa Dowie's mind has to do with colonial legacies and contemporary international relations. Thus the focus of the conference, according to Elsa Dowie, was on the material ways in which women were oppressed with little to no attention as to how women's oppression had come about in the first place. But for Elsa Dowie, as for Leacock, the cause was clear, the patriarchal class system. This is the, a term that Elsa Dowie uses multiple times in her, in her work. So this is a system that she understands as a self-identified socialist feminist as underlying all forms of oppression as a, and as dating back to the beginning of slavery in ancient Egypt. So this is part of, again, her, her body of work. In addition to the conference's general lack of attention to the causes of women's oppression, the inattention to the fact that, quote, underdeveloped national groups exist in the heart of the developed industrial world that is Black, Chicano, Hispanic, and Native American minorities in the United, United States and immigrant workers from the third world and nations in Europe, end quote, frustrated efforts at an open exchange, according to Elsa Dowie and other observers. In a 1983 interview with journalists from an African-American publication with roots in the civil rights movement in the United States, Elsa Dowie explained, quote, at these international conferences, you listen to us because we know about our problems and how to diagnose them. And you speak about your own problems in your own countries, end quote. If women committed to analyzing their own societies and the roles of those societies in terms of international trade and politics, then, quote, meeting in such conferences is quite useful, end quote. But the bottom line for Elsa Dowie was that, quote, there has to be an exchange of information, end quote. So the significance of the Wellesley Conference for Elsa Dowie is that it raised her awareness of the problematic framing of conversations on women and development by some experts. She came to understand that it was those with greater access to resources and funding who steered conversations away from what she believed to be the real issues. And always looking for ways to reach new audiences, Elsa Dowie next turned to the United Nations and to translations of her published works to have her voice heard in new arenas. And both of these measures came with new possibilities, but also with new problems. So Elsa Dowie joined the UN in 1978 where she directed the African Training and Research Center for Women in Ethiopia and later advised the UN's Economic Commission for West Africa and Lebanon. 
during her two-year tenure at the UN, al Sadawi gradually lost her reverence for international development experts, whom she came to see as pushing a narrative that at best had little to do with the lived reality of most Africans, and at worst supported forms of colonialism. In a passage about her time at the UN in My Travels Around the World, this is a book that she wrote in the 1980s, al Sadawi described what she saw as self-serving policy recommendations within the UN. She observed that many UN experts refused to interact with those living in poverty to learn more about their situations. Yet they did not hesitate to promote themselves by putting forth ideas that would, quote, solve the problem of hunger for us poor, end quote. Many of the solutions put forward, according to Elsa Dali, blame so-called developing nations for their, quote, unquote, underdevelopment by latching onto simple explanations, such as the population explosion, to account for any failures in UN development policies and projects. And as she came to recognize shortcomings in the UN system, al Sadari understood that she needed to continue to publish her own analyses of the issues and sought to have her work, which up until that point was published only in Arabic, translated. She succeeded with her first book to be translated into English, The Hidden Face of Eve, published through Z Books in 1980. In it, she analyzes various forms of women's oppressions, as well as women's resilience and agency in the Arab world. The El Sadawi faced a conundrum common to women's rights activists from the global south. That is because her published work brought attention to shortcomings in Arab societies, including the prevalence of child sexual abuse, female genital cutting, honor killings and rape. Some political, literary and religious leaders in Egypt and elsewhere in the Arab world decried her and her findings for airing dirty laundry to international audiences and for accepting Western norms in regard to women's societal roles. The fact that El Sadawi published such reports during a period when foreign imports, particularly from Israel and, and the United States, replaced Egyptian goods on the shelves may have contributed to domestic opposition to her work. In the 1970s, many Egyptians looked on outside influence with suspicion and blamed President Sadat's infita or open door policies for social disintegration and economic crises in Egypt. And although El Sadawi also criticized Sadat's policies her goal of empowering women placed a target on her back, according to other participants in the Egyptian women's movement. At the same time, El Sadawi encountered criticism on the part of some feminists from the global north who questioned her authenticity because she spoke out on what they deemed to be political and not women's issues. When she connected women's problems in the Arab world with colonial legacies and international relations. Thus, El Sadawi faced admonishment within Egypt for bringing attention to women's rights issues and clashed with some within transnational feminist circles for looking beyond Arab culture to explain injustices imposed on women. So for El Sadawi, this challenge came to a head at the UN Second World Conference on Women in Copenhagen. Two of the issues that El Sadawi spoke about at the conference, Palestinian women's lives and female genital cutting practices garnered much attention during the conference and her outspokenness on these issues earned her both condemnation and commendation. So El Sadawi first worked with Palestinian refugees in Jordan in 1968, and her post at the UN in Beirut again brought her into contact with Palestinian refugees living in camps in Lebanon. More broadly at the UN, she worked with 14 governments in the Middle East, including the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO, on issues of women's access to educational, social, and economic resources. Part of her efforts at the UN in Beirut went into drafting a report on the special issues of Palestinian women. Thus, the Copenhagen Conference Secretariat tapped El Sadawi to speak to the journalist's encounter in order to provide a synopsis of the study that she had conducted at the UN. Her presentation did not go off without a hitch, however, as following it, an Israeli reporter attacked El Sadawi and the study, complaining that the Israeli perspective was missing from the report and charging El Sadawi with ignoring in injustices perpetrated against women in Arab societies, including female circumcision and child marriage. A heated exchange among various members of the press ensued, with the Israeli journalist repeatedly shouting derogatory questions at El Sadawi, and the moderator eventually took hold of the situation and the proceedings continued, but some of the coverage of the disagreement painted El Sadawi as, quote, pro-PLO, anti-Israel, and anti-United States, end quote, and attempts to brush off her statement and damage her credibility. The context of this portrayal of El Sadawi should not go without comment, 
1978, the United States brokered, brokered a peace treaty between Israel and Egypt, the Camp David Accords, to go into effect in 1979. But many intellectuals and leftist groups in Egypt, as well as the leaders of most Arab countries and the PLO, rejected the treaty because it was seen as thwarting the possibility of Palestinian self-determination. Al Sadawi herself both publicly criticized the accords, and President Sadat had taken measures to limit the power of politicians who spoke out against the treaty as well. By contrast the to the criticism of the Camp David Accords received in the Arab world, the United States, Europe, and Israel celebrated the treaty with Sadat and the Israeli Prime Minister sharing the Nobel Peace Prize in 1978. So it was in this highly divisive atmosphere that the Copenhagen Conference took place. Now, despite the Israeli journalist's accusation that El Sadari ignored women's rights abuses in Arab societies, El Sadari spoke precisely on those issues on a number of occasions during the forum and had been speaking out on just such issues since her tenure as a rural doctor in Egypt in the, 19, in the late 1950s. As a village doctor, El Sadari caused a stir by confronting rituals and practices executed by dayas or midwives and village barbers that jeopardized the health of her patients. Some of the common operations performed by these groups of people included un in unsanitary inoculations, circumcision, and I'm using that word because that's the word that El Sadari uses, of both female and male children, and quote unquote deflorations of brides. El Sadari's medical training had left her unprepared to intervene in such practices. But because she had to repair damage caused by these operations, including infections because dyes and barbers often did not sterilize the instruments that they used, El Sadari began educating villagers about the potential harmful consequences of these procedures during her weekly rounds in the village. Her educational campaign, however, aggravated the dyes and village barbers who made a significant proportion of their wages by performing these rituals. As El Sadari's housekeeper at the time put it, quote, how will they, the dyes and barbers, buy food for themselves if circumcisions and deflorations are no longer done in the village, end quote. Now our housekeeper's assessment of the situation foretold the resistance of the World Health Organization when received in the 1980s, after it took up the mantle to ban the practice of female genital cutting in all of its forms. As historian Kelly Shannon explains, quote, women who performed the surgeries often depended on the income they received from the families of the girls and women they cut so they had no economic incentive to cease the practice, end quote. And other reasons also prevented practitioners from giving up female circumcision, from parents' fears for their daughter's marriageability if they remained uncut, to beliefs that circumcision was a religious requirement. In the 1950s, Elsa Dye was on the forefront of challenging these rituals, but even as a medical professional, she had limited means of stopping the practice. Over the following decades, Elsa Dari continued to call out female circumcision and other prevalent customs that she saw as harmful to women, eventually publishing several nonfiction works on women's rights issues as a medical professional in the 1970s, the first of which, Women and Sex, led to her dismissal from her directorship at the Ministry of Health in 1972. <clears throat> in Women and Sex, Elsa Dari continued the work she had begun as a rural doctor in the 1950s, this time, however, El Sadari brought more attention to the psychological as well as the physical repercussions of these customs based on her clinical work as a psychologist in the intervening 15 years. She argued that societal expectations of women's sexuality, including the sexual double standard in Egyptian society, which made it, quote, very difficult for a woman not to be married, end quote, and bestowed upon young girls the responsibility of upholding the family honor could lead to neuroses. Contemporary reviews of the work praised El Sadari's use of scientific evidence alongside personal experience to criticize gender roles. And El Sadari received invitations to present her findings at various venues. According to literary scholar Nara Ghali, El Sadari's attention to women's sexual oppression distinguished her analysis of women's lives from that of other Arab feminists who focused on forms of political, economic, social, and religious injustices. Writing and lecturing about women's sexuality even as a medical professional, opened El Sadawi up to harsh censure, however, particularly on the part of those in positions of authority and marked the, quote, official end of her medical career, end quote. But speaking in hindsight during a 1980 interview at the Copenhagen Conference, El Sadawi did not seem to regret that she had lost her job due to her writing and told the interviewer that she had managed to publish a book a year between 1972 and 1978. Indeed, following the publication of Women and Sex, and despite it being banned in Egypt, 
El Sadawi received a, quote, avalanche of letters, telephone calls, and visits from young and old, men and women, asking for a way out of problems, end quote. Thus, she felt compelled to keep writing, believing that, quote, the great majority of men and women in our society carry a thirst for greater knowledge and understanding and a sharp hunger for further progress, end quote. Years later, Al Sadawi continued to embrace her role as a feminist writer when in conversation with a Middle Eastern scholar, she declared that, quote, her writings healed more people, especially women, than her clinical work ever could, end quote. Ironically, far from silencing and discrediting El Sadawi, the loss of her position in the Ministry of Health helped her reach new audiences and allowed her to dedicate her efforts to analyzing and publishing about the shortcomings she saw in society, especially in regard to women. It should be of no surprise then that El Sadari did not shrink from speaking out on women's rights violations in the Arab world at the Copenhagen Conference. Indeed, at one workshop just a few days into the NGO forum, El Sadari gained broad press coverage when she described her own circumcision, relating what she had written in the first chapter of The Hidden Face of Eve, titled The Question That No One Would Answer. And this is an excerpt from it that was published in Niz in the spring of 1980. In the months and years preceding and succeeding the conference in Copenhagen, feminist periodicals published excerpts from El Sadari's work, as well as brief reports stemming from others' research on the practice of female genital cutting, bringing unprecedented awareness of the issue to international audiences. <clears throat> One woman's research gained the attention necessary to launch an international campaign to end such practices. In 1979, American feminist, journalist, and urban planner Fran Hoskin published a 370-page report on what she termed female genital mutilation, FGM, detailing various forms of the practice of female genital cutting in parts of Africa and the Arab world for an international audience. While feminists such as El Sadawi, who had confronted the issue in their home countries for decades, may have welcomed hosted support in dismantling systems of oppression that manifested themselves through such practices. Hoskin's approach to the subject thwarted cooperation between feminists from the global south and the global north. Several observers described Hoskin's campaign to end the practice of FGM as a quote unquote crusade, one which Hoskin seemed to see herself as fighting for and not with women from societies where, her gender, where female genital cutting was commonly practiced. Indeed, in a forward to her report, Hoskin claimed that, quote, neither the women who continue today to perform these operations, nor the young upon whom these operations are performed, know the health damage involved, end quote. And she wrote explicitly about El Sadali in these terms. That is, in Hoskin, Hoskin paraphrased a 1978 interview conducted with El Sadali, in which El Sadali described her own circumcision in a chapter that provided a case study of FGM in Egypt. And in Hoskin's concluding remarks about Egypt in that chapter, she erased any agency on the part of Egyptian women, including El Sadawi, by asserting, quote, exposed since childhood to all kinds of myths about their own bodies, socialized to accept male domination in all areas, but especially sexuality. Even the women who reject the operations as brutal never question the institution or the reason why the operations are demanded by men, end quote. Yet El Sadawi and other medical professional, professionals did know the health consequences, had led educational campaigns in their local areas, and had pushed for change. Now, likely in response to Hoskin's report, in the preface to the English edition of The Hidden Face of Eve, which was published in 1980, El Sadawi characterized some feminists in the US and Europe as, quote, raising a hue and a cry in defense of the victims of female circumcision writing long articles and delivering speeches at Congresses. Of course, she clarifies, it is good that female circumcision be denounced. But by concentrating on such manifestations, there is a risk that the real issues of social and economic change may be evaded or even forgotten, end quote. She warned, quote, that effective action may be replaced by a feeling of superior humanity, a glow of satisfaction that may blind the mind and feelings to the concrete everyday struggle for women's emancipation, end quote. And she, quote, disagreed with those women in America and Europe who concentrate on issues such as female circumcision and to pick them as proof of the unusual and barbaric oppression to which women are exposed only in African and Arab countries. I oppose all attempts to deal with such problems in isolation, end quote, she declared. 
Specifically, Elsa and I wanted to place the conversation on female general cutting practices within a larger discussion on imperialism, capitalism, and patriarchy, because she insisted the oppression of women, quote, constitutes an integral part of the political, economic, and cultural system for Padra and most of the world, end quote. Thus, from the outset, El Sadawi made a point of pushing against narratives that imply that only women in Arab or Islamic societies or women in the global South faced oppression. And she also challenged those who would argue that the cultures of the societies were solely to blame for women's subjugation. Toskin and a number of other feminists in the global North wrote off such arguments on the part of El Sadawi and other feminists in the global South as quote unquote male politics frequently portraying women from the global south as dupes of male political leaders. In print and in private correspondence, Postman explicitly attacked El Sadawi in the 1980s, referring to her as, quote, a PLO spokesperson, end quote, end quote, a tool of the PLO, end quote, a portrayal meant to bring into question El Sadawi's integrity. Postman also charged El Sadawi with undercutting international efforts to end FGM. But according to historian Kelly Shannon, Hoskin herself undermined her own campaign. Shannon arg argues that Hoskins and later the World Health Organization's misconstruction of the situation as one where people on the ground did not know the health effects of cutting practices resulted in problematic compromises when it came to ending FGM. For example, those who had reason to continue cutting practices for monetary gain, for instance, pressed for more sanitary conditions in which to perform the operation not a total cessation of such practices as a solution to the problem. Thus, despite Hoskins' intentions, her portrayal of the facts weakened the response to her campaign. Now, although the discourse and debate surrounding FGM at the Copenhagen Conference provides only one example of the ways in which feminists from the global south and global <laughs> north tackle matters of global import, it illustrates the complexity of such interactions. For her part, El Sadawi was clearly exasperated with the treatment of the subject by women from the global north. She and other feminists from the global south told interviewers that they saw the issue of FGM being quote unquote sensationalized at Copenhagen in ways that both overshadowed other problems women and their families faced and obscured the fact that female general cutting was just one form of the patriarchal control of women's sexuality that women all over the globe endured. Some feminists from the global south clearly wanted to take back control of the narrative over women's rights issues in Africa and the Arab world and to place the practice of FGM within the larger context of exploitation of and the fight for control over women's bodies and sexuality all over the world. Yet El Sadawi's exasperation did not lead to a chasm between feminists from the global north and global south. On the contrary, El Sadawi continued to be in demand following the Copenhagen conference. Book translations, speaking engagements in the global north, and interviews all indicate her popularity. At home in Egypt, however, her outspokenness marked her as a troublesome to the regime, and she faced persecution, including imprisonment for three months in 1981. Arrested during a crackdown on political dissidents, al Sadawi was not allowed visits from her family or her lawyer. With little means of recourse, her husband, Sharif Hattara, turned to al Sadawi's international context to ask for help in pressing for her release. News of El Sadawi's imprisonment soon spread with both mainstream and women's media picking up the story. And El Sadawi's allies, inside and outside of the Arab world, wrote to Egyptian diplomats, signed appeals, and in other ways spoke out, calling for her immediate release. During El Sadawi's imprisonment, Sadat's regime fell and President Hosni Mubarak released political prisoners, including El Sadawi, after taking office. So it's unknown whether the international outcry had anything to do with El Sadari's release, but such outpourings of condemnation will speak to El Sadari's and her family's ability to put her international network to good use, to call out an, an injustice against her, and also reveals an uneasy relationship wherein global North feminists who place themselves in the role of savior by demanding El Sadari's freedom. <clears throat> Plenty of studies have shown that women from decolonizing nations are often put in the impossible situation of being both upholders of tradition and signifiers of their society's modernity, and that women who speak out against societal traditions are labeled inauthentic dissidents by political and religious leaders. Thus, El Sadawi's difficulties in her home country should be of no surprise. What we learned from El Sadawi's story here is that when she turned to the international realm at the Copenhagen Conference, and on the issue of FGM, 
Her authenticity was also challenged by some Global North feminists who claimed that her political views, that is her advocacy on behalf of Palestinian refugees, eliminated her ability to speak out on Arab and African women's rights. Yet her beliefs in regard to Arab and African women's rights stem directly from her lived experiences in, as an Egyptian woman, a rural doctor, a UN advisor, and a practicing psychologist. Further, her forthrightness captivated many audiences. Thus, this is also not a simple story of imperial feminism in Toto. That is not all global North feminists condemned al Sadawi, and she became a celebrated voice and remained, quote, consistently in demand, end quote, up until her death in March of 2021. Challenging stereotypes about feminists and feminisms, as well as stereotypes held by feminists, al Sadawi spoke across geopolitical borders and called attention to the political, social, and historical complexity of women's situations. And by doing so, she won distinction as she forwarded her own vision of solidarity and transnational feminism. Thank you. I was gonna. If you guys have a question, wouldn't mind. Or on Yes, so thank you to Professor Frazier for that, that wonderful uh, and thought-provoking presentation. Um, can I invite anyone with a question to come up here to hear it just in the interests of sound on Zoom? Thank you, Professor Fraser, for such an awesome presentation. Um, and thank you for suffering the questions that will come from an interested interloper and collegial neighbor in Washburn Hall. Um, two questions that I hope will be helpful for you as you go forward um, in the work. The one is, uh, could you talk to us a little bit about that broader context of Egypt that frames uh, El Sadawi's uh, activities, her activism, her, her efforts to bring forth these important issues. Uh, and then the second is, what do you see as her critique in a nutshell? I have a couple of things that I was able to scribble down here, like patriarchal class system or the asymmetry of power uh, that basically she saw in the funding that supported Global North Scholars who, who criticized her. So yeah. those are two questions that may be on different tracks, but. I'd be yeah. happy to learn anything that you'd like to offer. Yeah, so I think in terms of let's see, situating her in Egypt, I think there's a few things there. Um, so I think she's very much, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna this off since you all are still fairly far away from me. Um, she's, she's, also, she's very much a daughter of her father who um, participated in, um, the revolution against and the protests against British colonialism in the 19 teens. Uh, and he like regales her and her, and her siblings the stories of his patriotism and um, his, his anti colonialism or anti imperialism. Um, and so she's very much from her childhood sees herself as an anti imperialist and an anti colonialist. Like that's very much ingrained in her. So she's already has coming from her father this um, critique of colonialism, this critique of the interaction between people from the global north and people from the global south. So I think that, I mean, kind of bring, brings both of those questions together. Um, at the same time, she's at a very early age also able to recognize her own gender. She has a very, she has gender consciousness um, as a child, which is not something that everyone has. People don't always recognize their own gender as, as a child or, or you know, similar, you know, social constructions um, that we live with. Um, but she remembers, so she was the second child of nine and her older sibling was a brother. And she remembers her brother receiving twice as much money on, you know, holidays because that's what it says in the Quran that he deserves twice as much as, as, as a girl does. And, she, and that very much, that struck her from a young age. So I think there are a couple of things that like, stemming from her childhood that I obviously can't get into because we can only talk about so much in a paper um, that kind of roots her in, in the 
the way that she was brought up it kind of roots her in, into the criticism that then she could see. You know, she's already, from a young age, she's already seeing colonialism and she's already seeing this gender critique. And so but she's seeing it in a certain way. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Eve or oh, I wonder where um, she was educated. Uh, we talked a little bit about what her education was over the years. Yeah, so she was educated all in, in Egypt. Um, so she begins in, so she lives in a rural area as a child and is educated there in a, in a rural village school up until about the age of 14 or so. And she goes off to boarding school. And it's during World War II that she goes off to boarding school. And there's a lot of, again, a lot of unrest in Egypt at the time. And she actually joins protests in the 1940s as a teenager against the British again. Um, so like, again, like bringing attention to like her revolutionary spirit from a, at a very young age. Um, and then she goes to medical school in Cairo. Um, so she's, she's, um, she stays in Egypt for her entire, and then after that is when she starts to leave the country sometimes, but it's not for her education that she leaves the country. Thank you. Yeah. Jessica, I have two questions, uh, very different questions. One is wanting you to talk a little bit more about where she was situated within this network of international Global South feminists. Okay. I think that would gesture to when you talk about your larger book. Yeah. And also wondering what the long term impact of her activism was on the cause of um, FGM. On the cause of FGM, is that what you said? Yeah. Okay. Um, so her position in networks in the Global South is kind of an odd one. Um, so there's another woman that I'm looking at in the book who's an Indian economist and she's much more central. She, she forms an a organization in the 1980s that like is bringing together the voices of women from the global South. Um, now Elsa Dowie does it to a certain extent, but she's also very much kind of like a lone person, a lone activist. Um, Egyptian feminists complain about her in some cases, the fact that she is like, she's off, she's doing her own thing. She does though in the 1980s, she forms the Arab women's Solidarity Association that is supposed to be international. I think it's at least to some extent, but people also complain about nepotism within the organization where like, she's she's the leader and then her daughter is the editor of the magazine. Um, her husband's involved in uh, a, leader, a leadership position as well. So there's some complaints. So she's not actually, I mean, everybody knows her and she's like a star, um, but, she, but sometimes being a star means that you're not really part of the network because you're kind of standing above it or you know outside of it. So that's where she is, which is an interesting thing to think about. Uh, and then her position in FGM. So I think to some extent, I think it's mixed. I mean, she obviously through her personal narrative, she's able to bring attention to it. And But I don't think it's told in the way that she wants it to be told that when she publishes her book, so her first, her first book to get translated into English, The Hidden Face of Eve, I think I put it up on the screen that the more literal translation is um, the naked face of the Arab woman, which is quite different. <laughs> um, and so even like the title indicates how she loses control over what she is saying. But another aspect of that is, so the question no one would answer, which is the chapter that's about her, her own circumcision, that got bumped up to become the first chapter when it was translated to English before it was towards the end of the book and it was elongated too when it was translated into English. So again, so she brings attention to it, but she does, that's not what her cause is. Her cause isn't to bring attention to FGM. Um, her cause is to bring attention to broad women's issues in the Arab world, but also to the fact that it's not just about women, it's not just about gender, it's about uh, imperialism, it's about capitalism. These are the things that are happening in Egypt and in the Arab world that are the problem, right? Like patriarchy is there, right? She talks about the, patri the, the critique, the patriarchal class system is her critique. So it's all together, but she wants it to be all together. She doesn't want it to be separated. Um, so I just want to echo the the celebration of the, of 
like it's, it's a fascinating paper. Thank you so much. And I kind of wanted to follow up, I guess, a little bit. Eve's question, my question is for messed it together. I'm curious about the publisher. Um, I mean, I, I don't speak Arabic, so I'm more interested, I guess, in the American translations. Yeah. Um, Z, I don't know if Zed published all of her books, but sort of yeah. what were the what were the publishing networks she was tapping into? Do we know anything about the editors who made those decisions that she was just describing? And how does that fit into a broader uh, yeah. history of like the importation of non Anglophone feminists yeah. in the US? Yeah. So there's, yeah, so um, most of her works are published through Zed Books. I don't have like that in my memory. <laughs> she, has, she has a lot of books. Um, and then they are translated by various people. Um, and so the extent to which, and she, she talks about this a little bit, but I'm also still learning about this. I'm still, so that's a question that I still have is how much power did she have over the translations? Now, sometimes her husband was the translator. So I am assuming that she had some power over those translations. Um, and her husband is the translator on, on a couple of volumes, but he's not always. Um, but it is something that she has spoken about that, that her words were used and she didn't necessarily have a say in how they were used or how it was edited or how it was changed that, that the public, that the editor itself. But yeah, I haven't gotten a chance to look more into Zed books and to see who the editors were and what they were saying. That would be something, I'm not sure if they would have that information available, but it's something to look for. Yeah. yeah I think that's a good question. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I remember going to El Sadawi's talk a, a long time ago, and I remember one of the things that she said that I always remember it as a joke is how she, when she was a child, she said that she was always scared. And she was always scared about this idea of religion and the God and how is that there was always a hell and how is that she was always scared about that. And she said that somebody, I don't remember who told her, well, no, I mean, hell doesn't exist, right? And that was a moment for her that she's like, oh, okay. And then she remembers that her dissolution when the same person told her, but heaven doesn't exist either, right? So to, to what extent religion is something that she touches on her work as this patriarchal thing? Yeah, I think that is something, yeah, that is very much central to, it is central to her childhood too, like the, the religion aspect in her childhood and how her parents are raising her, but also how there are different interpretations of religion that she's seeing in, you know, within her own kind of, within her own family, her, her mother, father, and, and their children. But then when she goes and visits, visits her grandmother in the village and how they're interpreting religion there. Um, and she talks about different conversations that she had with her, her father's mother in particular, and how she interpreted religion and how she very much was um, an upholder in gender roles in many ways, in terms of like, she had just the one son and she made sure that her son was educated and went on up to college and, you know, and this is about his father, um, was able to get a, a job in the government and move out of the village um, and her daughters remained in the village. So there's like some, some gender segregation there. And then that is coming from, you know, her, her religious beliefs, and like her interpretation. Um, but at the same time, that same grandmother, the way that her grandmother actually lived contradicted the gender roles, that her grandmother was the strongest person that she knew, that her grandmother was out in the field all day long and, you know, never had to take a break, never took a break, and that her grandmother, in many ways, even though she, she was illiterate, she was so wise, and so it's, and it's an interesting just the contradictions and that she calls out about her, her own childhood. Uh, yeah. Um, Zahara Magani has a, a question. What is her legacy? In other words, has her intersectional analyses influenced current transnational feminist movements in the Arab world? Yeah, I think definitely. <laughs> um, yeah, I think definitely she's 
I mean, like I said at the end of the paper, she remained consistently in demand up until her death. Um, she was involved in the um, the Arab Spring in 2011. She was out. She was, and she was writing about the revolution. And she had young people in her apartment um, for weeks at a time. So she was like still very much a central figure. And I think she was seen as someone who um, just had so much knowledge. And she was. She became someone who was a mentor um, to a lot of younger generations too. Yeah. Great, then I guess I'll, I'll, ask, I'll ask a question. Uh, I was really intrigued that the first article you showed by her was co-authored with Basim Amiramisi. Yeah. Who's, you know, this, as you know, this huge figure in, in uh, Middle Eastern feminism. Yeah. Um, and they're also kind of interesting in that both of them uh, are fascinated with the figure of uh, Shafrazad uh, from the 1001 1, Nights. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, where they agreed and, and how they and how they differ. Uh, yeah, I mean, they certainly have different paths. I mean, where needs to, I mean, Eve's question about how now Asadawi fit within the Global South networks, where he fits. Like she's in the Global South networks. She's she's definitely much more um, someone that is able to collaborate internationally with Global South feminists, and, and and I think she just has a different perspective and a different voice than what now Elsa Dowdy does. Um, whereas Elsa Dowdy again, she's like she's definitely she's off. She's on her own. And she's on, she's her own figure, and even though she's creating this, she's she has created this organization, the Arab Women's Solidarity Association. She's still very much up on her own. So I think there's like a big difference in um, the ways that they're actually trying to collaborate with people, um, which I think then perhaps speaks to their views on, um, on women's networks. Any last questions, or should I call? I call you to. Jesse, thank you for a really interesting talk, and thank you, Alan, for moderating, and Laura for managing the technology. I and I shout out to all of you who are zooming in from home. Thank you for joining us that way. I hope you all will join us in one month on November 18th when Kathy DeCesare from History talks about her research and the title of her talk is The Bermuda Prize. Thank you.